We begin our service today with a service of remembrance, which you will find in your leaflet insert. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I invite you to stand for O Canada. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, 
nor are the years condemned. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. O King and Judge of the nations, we remember before you with grateful hearts the men and women of our armed forces, who in the day of decision ventured much for the liberties we now enjoy. Grant that we may not rest until all the people of this land share the benefits of true freedom and gladly accept its disciplines. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns now and forever.
Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall be whole and not another. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Even so, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. spirit. Let us pray. O God, who by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light, grant that your servants, being raised with Christ, may know the strength of his presence and rejoice in his eternal glory, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Please be seated for the first lesson. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. But the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be an affliction and they are going from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace. For though in the sight of men they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Like gold in the furnace, he tried them, and like a sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted. In the time of their visitation, they will shine forth and will run like sparks through the stubble. They will govern nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord will reign over them forever. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are upon his elect, and he watches over his holy ones. Here ends the reading. Today's psalm is Psalm 121, which is in the leaflet insert. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. Indeed, it is he who shall keep your soul. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. Indeed, it is he who shall keep your soul. I will lift up my eyes unto the hill. Behold, he who 
keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. Indeed, it is he who shall keep your soul. The Lord himself is your keeper. The Lord is your defense upon your right hand, so that the sun shall not burn you by day, neither the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. Indeed, it is he who shall keep your soul. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. Indeed, it is he who shall keep your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth A reading from the book of Revelation. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hand, and carrying, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand, if you're able, for our gradual hymn, hymn number 487. And as we sing this hymn, the children are invited to go to Sunday school.
Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Hopefully, lovingly. 
We're treading into mysterious waters here, and we need to go lightly and hold unknown things loosely. Things are even more difficult because we're working with translations. So, uh, our English Bibles, for example, often translate many different Hebrew and Greek words and concepts with the same English word. For example, Sheol, Hades, Tartarus, and Gehenna are all translated with one word in our English Bible, hell. But they're different concepts. So we'll try to clear some of that up today. Secondly, though there is a great deal of mystery and we can that we can dispute about, there is one thing that we can agree on, and that we can believe and proclaim together with all our hearts, and that's this, that Jesus Christ, by his death and resurrection, has conquered death. That we can all agree. Death no longer has dominion over him, nor does it have dominion over any who are in Christ. Because he lives, we also shall live. All our hope is set on the risen Christ. It's because of him that we acknowledge the remission of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. So if we get nothing else from this sermon, that's the truth we need to walk away with today. That Christ has conquered death. That doesn't mean you can fall asleep during the rest, though. <laughs> Okay, with that in mind, let's kind of wade into these waters carefully now. I think the easiest way to get at the Christian understanding of the afterlife is to trace the biblical understanding from the beginning. So I'm going to do a little, little Old Testament survey for you here on this doctrine. In the Old Testament, it was believed that all those who died went down to Sheol. That's the Hebrew word for the grave. And very early on, this seems to be simply a word for the grave. There wasn't much of a belief in the afterlife initially. But as Israel grew and time went along, Sheol also began to be used to describe the place or the state of the departed. All the dead, it was thought, whether righteous or unrighteous, ultimately went down to Sheol. When the Old Testament was translated into Greek, Sheol was translated Hades. So we can think of Sheol and Hades as kind of the same con concept, the abode of the dead. Sheol, Hades, was a shadowy underworld, a place of darkness. Its gates were locked. No one could escape. The praise of God was not heard in Hades. The psalmist declares, for in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? But, at the same time, the psalmist also acknowledges that God's presence is found even in Hades. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If, my, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Such was the Old Testament view of the afterlife. A dark, shadowy prison, common to all, void of the praise of God, but not necessarily void of the presence of God. However, as Israel grew in their knowledge of God, so did their understanding of Hades. After Israel's exile in Babylon, during the Second Temple period, and into the time between the Old and New Testaments, we see two developments in the Jewish understanding of the afterlife. The first development is that Sheol, or Hades, came to be seen as divided between two compartments, so to speak. One compartment was the abode of the righteous dead, and the other was the abode of the wicked. The abode of the righteous dead was called Paradise, or the bosom of Abraham, or Abraham's side. Whereas the boat of the wicked was simply called Hades, or perhaps Gehenna. We see this division of Hades in our Lord's story of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember? Lazarus died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, 
he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. In this story, Abraham says, there's a great chasm that divides the two compartments of Hades. He says, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. So that's the first development, that kind of separation into different compartments of Hades. The second development was that there was a growing expectation and a hope amongst the people of God that eventually God would raise the righteous from Hades. That there would be, as we say now, a resurrection of the dead. The clearest Old Testament passage about a future bodily resurrection is Daniel 12, 2. It says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The psalmist also expresses this hope. He says, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, and, or let your Holy One see corruption. And God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. However, we know that in Jesus' day there were some, like the Pharisees, who believed in the resurrection, while others, like the Sadducees, denied the resurrection. So there's a lot of different beliefs about the resurrection of the dead in the time of Christ. Jesus, as we saw last week, clearly excuse me, refuted the Sadducees and taught the resurrection of the dead. So to summarize so far, I know this is a lot of background information, but we need this background information to understand our understanding of the afterlife. To summarize, in the Old Testament, the people of God believed that all the dead went to a shadowy underworld, Sheol or Hades, the gates of Hades were locked. It was separated into two impassable compartments, a blessed paradise for the righteous and a place of torment for the wicked. And there was a growing hope in the resurrection of the dead. This was the state of things until we come to the great hinge event in all of history, the event that changed everything forever. What was that event? Yes, yes. The death and resurrection of Jesus. The death and resurrection of Jesus. I want to talk for a minute about the death of Jesus. We say in the Apostles' Creed that Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried. And then what do we say? He descended into hell. That is, he descended into Hades. Remember, the blessed compartment of Hades was called paradise. What did Christ say to the thief on the cross? Truly I tell you, today, the day of our death, you will be with me, where? In paradise. In paradise. That is, in the abode of the righteous dead. Our 1962 prayer book catechism comments on this article of the Creed. It says, note, this, I love this very prayer book or, or, uh, note here. Note that the words of the Creed, he descended into hell, are considered as words of the same meaning as... He went into the place of departed spirits. So that's what we mean by he descended to hell. So when Jesus died, this is important now, he didn't go to heaven. In fact, we read in John's Gospel of how on Easter Sunday, Jesus told Mary Magdalene, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. He had not ascended into heaven, but he had, with the thief on the cross, descended into paradise. Now, what did Christ do in Hades? <laughs> here, again, we're into mysterious territory here. Okay, But I'm going to give you what I think is the classical Christian view of what happened. His entrance into Hades was different than any other human beings. In that because the God-man, as, as the God-man, he atoned for all the sins of the world by his bloodshed on the cross, the power of death and Hades was totally vanquished. The scriptures say that death came into the world because of sin, and Jesus destroyed all sin, Therefore, as we say in the preface of Easter, 
Jesus trampled down death by his death, and upon those in the tombs bestowed blood, bestowed life. He and only he was able to open the gates of Hades. And listen to what he says in the book of Revelation. I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of what? Death and Hades. I have the keys. That is, I'm able to unlock the door of death and Hades. So what did Jesus do in Hades? First, according to classical Christian thought, he preached the good news of his death to the souls in Hades. This is what 1 Peter says. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which, that is, in his spirit, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Or he went and preached to the souls in prison. <laughs> Very mysterious. Later on, he says, the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, Peter says. That though judged in the flesh the way people are, that is, they died, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So it seems that in Hades, Christ announced the good news of his death to those in paradise. Second, according to classical Christian thought, with the keys of death in Hades, Christ opened the gates, leading the God-fearing saints of the Old Covenant out. This is traditionally called the harrowing of hell. And if you look up the harrowing of hell on the internet, harrowing of hell art, You'll see all through the ages there's art of Jesus, usually dressed in bright robes with a cross in his hand, ushering this great train of saints out of the mouth of Hades. Sometimes Hades is shown as this great beast with teeth, and the Old Testament saints are coming out. It's very interesting. We don't usually think of things like this, do we? No. The harrowing of hell. Now, I want to mention something in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew contains a very mysterious verse. In Matthew 27, it says that when Christ died, this is before the resurrection, mind you, when Christ died, during his descent into Hades, the earth shook, and rocks were split, the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. I always forget about that verse, that on the day of his death, the tombs were opened, and people came out of the graves. I always thought as a kid, what the heck does that mean? I think it has something to do with being a visible sign that Hades had been opened by the death of the Lord. I think. I don't know. There was an earthquake. There was an earthquake. That's right. That's right. This curtain was torn in two. There was an earthquake. The rocks split. The graves opened. How are we doing so far? Okay? I know this is a lot, a lot of stuff here, but sometimes we need to remind ourselves of these things because we forget. Right? Now we're coming to the New Testament or the New Covenant understanding of the afterlife. Whereas in the Old Testament, paradise was understood to be part of Hades, in the New Testament, it seems that the old paradise has been emptied by the death of Christ, and that, and just bear with me for a minute, that a new paradise has been relocated, so to speak, to heaven. Now keep in mind that all this talk of places is our human language trying to speak about disembodied realities. So I'm not saying that there's a physical location in the universe where paradise is, okay? I'm not saying that. But from what Paul says in 2 Corinthians, it seems that paradise in the New Testament is spoken of as not being in Hades, but being in heaven. Listen to what Paul says. Paul writes to himself, I know a man in Christ, he's talking to himself and he's doing so humbly. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. So do you see how he, he equates the third heaven with paradise here in this text? 
Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows, he says that again. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. What is the third heaven, you ask? <laughs> what is this third heaven? Well, in ancient cosmology, the first heaven referred to what? Anyone know? The sky, that's right, the sky. The sky and the clouds. We talk about the heavens, right? The sky and the clouds. The second heaven was the stars and the planets, right? And the third heaven was the realm of God and his angels. So from the time of the death and resurrection of Christ, the church apparently understood paradise to be no longer the resting place of the righteous dead in Hades, but the resting place of the righteous dead in heaven. And I want to say that the key difference is not necessarily the location, but the presence of Christ in his person. Okay? Thus we can now say with St. Paul, when we die, we are absent from the body, but present with the Lord. Absent from the body, but present with the Lord. This state we may call paradise, or we can call it heaven. And that's what we commonly do. For those who reject Christ and his gospel, the resting place remains Hades. This state we commonly call hell. But, but, stay with me. I know this is a long one, okay? This is really important now. Really important. I'm sorry to keep going here because I'm usually wrapping up my sermon at this point. <laughs> But we can't stop here. We cannot stop here because going to heaven when we die is not the ultimate Christian hope because it is not our final state or final destination, if you like. In heaven, we remain disembodied spirits, which is not the end game for humanity from a biblical point of view. So what's next? Now I'm going to do a very quick rundown on the final things. So as Christians, we look forward to four final things. One, the return or second coming of Christ. Two, the resurrection of the body. Three, the last judgment. And four, the new heavens and the new earth. First, the return or second coming of Christ. Christ promised that he would return, this time not to die for sins, but to judge the quick and the dead, and to make all things new. Now, what does the scripture say about when he's coming back? We don't know. Exactly. No one knows the day or the hour. No one knows the day or the hour. However, there are suggestions in the scripture that there will be a number of signs of his coming. I'm going to run through about nine of these for you, very quickly, very quickly, okay? These include the preaching of the gospel to the whole world, the conversion of the Jewish people, a mysterious return of Enoch and Elijah, the two witnesses, the great apostasy, or a falling away of the faithful, the coming of an antichrist figure, disturbances in the natural world, earthquakes, fires, etc., the passing away or melting of the heavens, the sound of the trumpet, and the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens. Now, now, these things, okay, the order of these things, the chronology of these things, the exact interpretation of these things are a matter of much debate amongst Christians. And I'm not going to give you the one orthodox view on these things because there isn't one. There isn't one. <clears throat> but they're in Scripture, so we need to take them seriously. We can't just pretend that they're not there. They're there. There's also the matter of the thousand-year reign of Christ, or the millennium. Premillennialists believe that a literal thousand-year reign on earth will occur after Christ returns. Postmillennialists believe that the reign of Christ began at the Great Commission, and amillennialists believe that the millennium happened allegorically or symbolically. Now, the Church in its councils has never pronounced definitively all these things, but I think Justin Martyr in the second century had a really good approach. I want you to hear what he says here. This helps us in our discussions on these things. Now, Justin Martyr was a premillennialist. He believed in the premillennial. Um, 
that Christ is going to come, and then the, the millennium will, will happen. But listen to what he says to his friend Trifle the Jew. He says, I admitted to you formally that I and many others are of this opinion. We're premillennials. And believe that such will take place, as you assuredly are aware. But listen to what he says. But on the other hand, this is in the second century, I signify to you that many who belong to the pure and pious faith and are true Christians think otherwise. I love that. So he's in the second century, he says, this is what I believe on the millennium, but there are many of my brothers and sisters that have a different opinion on this. Very wise and gracious, and I'm just going to leave it right there. I'm just going to park it right there. What's the main thing? The main thing is that Christ will return and the dead will be raised. Listen to 1 Corinthians 4. But I do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him, when he returns, those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these things. What about those who utterly reject God and His Christ? They too will be raised in their bodies. Remember our discussion on Hades. Hades is the waiting place of the wicked. Listen to Revelation 20. <clears throat> then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was to be found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And listen to this. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged. Each one of them according to what they had done. Then, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Stern stuff. And finally, I'm getting, I'm, getting, I'm landing the plane. Here. After the return of Christ, the resurrection of the body, and the judgment of the wicked, we have the new heavens and the new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither there shall, be, shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away, and he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. So the end game is not a spiritual escape, but the union of heaven and earth in a renewed heavens and earth. Now I want to do just two very quick points of application here. And I know that was a ton of stuff. But here's just two points of application. <laughs> As Christians, we too often live as if this life was the only life. But really, this life is but a fraction of life eternal. St. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. We are so focused on this 
page, aren't we? Our troubles here, our sufferings here, our annoyances here. So and so is, I don't like that, what they're doing here. You know, we're so consumed with stuff and, and, our, and our finances and our, our, even our family and friends. All good, all good stuff. But we fail to remember that we're, we're here just for a little while and then there's going to be a whole new heavens and a new earth of life everlasting. So as Christians, we need to live as those who believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We also need to examine ourselves, as Paul says, to see that we are in the faith. Do we trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins? Have we, by grace, repented of our old way of life? Are we prepared for the return of the Lord? And secondly, if we believe these things, we need to ask God for the grace to tell others about the good news of Jesus. Jesus is the great hope for the world. Are we sharing the gospel first in how we live and second in sharing Christ with others the Lord prompts? I know that this idea is terrifying to most of us. But it's something we can pray about. We can ask the Lord, Lord, please provide me with opportunities to share the good news. I'm scared. I don't know how to share the good news with others. I don't want to talk about Jesus to others. Please provide me an opportunity. Last weekend, Richard and I had the opportunity to visit Kathleen Stewart of the Sacrament of Baptist Church. And she was telling us about the ladies that come to help her out. I think they help her to, you know, have a shower and this kind of stuff. Um, and they, you know, she, she did complain that they come at the wrong times. But apart from that, <laughs> she, meant, she mentioned that when they come, they ask her about her faith. And she's very clear. She says, I don't, I don't impose upon them. I don't force the conversation. She says, I think because they maybe see little crosses and things around that they know that I maybe have a faith and go to church, so they ask me. And she, so the door opens, and she, faithful saint that she is, walks through the door, and she tells these girls about her faith in Jesus. In fact, she has more of an evangelistic ministry staying at home than I do out in the world. And I told her that. And I encouraged her with those words. And she said that these ladies asked her to pray for them. So before they leave her house, they have a little prayer time. They pray, and Kathleen, you know who she is, a prayer warrior. And she prays for these ladies, I'm sure for any number of things, and then they're encouraged. They've heard the good news of Jesus, and she always says it. And I tell them of the good news of Jesus, how he died for our sins and rose again for us. That's the gospel. And that's all she says. Not grand theological treatises, but he, she just tells them of the Lord Jesus, who died for our sins and who rose again. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. We were encouraged, were we not? We went to encourage her, but we left encouraged by her. And went, man, I feel like I've had a pastoral visitation I'm here. <laughs> So that can encourage us. She doesn't force her faith on them. She prays for them. And when there's an opportunity, she, she walks through the door. And so can we. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we confess that much of this is mysterious to us. That we don't know everything. Um, we confess that we disagree with one another on these things. We pray that we will be united in the truth that you died defeating death, that you rose again, you conquered the grave, and that we are in you, and therefore death has no hope for us. We pray that you will impress that truth upon us today as we remember our brothers and sisters who have died in this memorial Eucharist. Encourage us with this, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
We're going to do a little something different today because it's a memorial Eucharist. We're going to stand and confess the Apostles' Creed together. We're going to say the Apostles' Creed, which is given in your leaflet insert. So I invite you to stand, and we will say the Apostles' Creed together. <laughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing for the prayers of the people. Let us pray. Let us pray, saying, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical, mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant, we pray, to your whole church in heaven and on earth, your light and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to newness of life, that through the great grave and gate of death we may pass with him to our joyful resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Grant to us who are still on our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith that your Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you in faithful obedience. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Grant to all who mourn a sure confidence in your fatherly care, that casting their grief on you, they may know the consolation of your love. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our, Hear our prayers. prayers. Help us, we pray, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to the life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, Hear our, our prayers. prayers. Grant us grace to entrust all our departed loved ones to your never-failing love. Receive them into the arms of your mercy, and remember them according to the favor which you show to all your people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Grant that, increasing in knowledge and love of you, all the faithful departed may go from strength to strength in a life of perfect service in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, Hear our prayers. prayers. Almighty God, grant us with all who have died in the hope of the resurrection the fullness of life in your eternal and everlasting glory, and with all your saints to receive the crown of life promised to all who share in the victory of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Please kneel if you are able. Join me in confessing, most merciful God, we confess to the
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I invite you to stand if you are able. And now may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. Let us offer one another a sign of the peace of God. Oh, 
Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. We do not come to the this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but by your abundance and grace We are not worthy of so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is all. Thank you. 
have an alternate post-communion prayer today, which is given on the final page of your leaflet insert, under the post-communion prayer heading. Let us pray. Together we pray, Almighty God, we thank you that in your great love you have fed us with spiritual food and drink of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have given us a foretaste of your heavenly hand. Grant that this sacrament may be to us a comfort and affliction and a pledge of our inheritance in that kingdom where there is no death, neither sorrow nor sorrow. couple of announcements today. Uh, do remember to pick up your copies on the table here. Uh, the one announcement I want to say is that we do have a, a pastoral care team and they, they do a wonderful job, uh, Florence and uh, Audrey. And welcome back, Audrey. Thank you. It's good to see you. I'm glad you're well. Um, but, but if you would like to speak with a clergyman, um, a priest or a deacon, we are always available to chat on the phone or to meet for coffee. Uh, or if you're, you need communion at home, uh, or to wrestle with life's difficult things, uh, or, or whatever it may be. Our, our cell numbers are both in the directory. So do not hesitate to call us, and don't say to yourself, oh, they're just too busy. Well, it's kind of part of our job. So if you need a priest or a deacon, call us, and we'll put the bat signal out and we'll be there. <laughs> Uh, any other announcements? Uh, oh, Marilyn. Uh, Marilyn Patty. Um, okay, uh, so just a quick note. Synod was on this week in Ontario. Yes. Ottawa, and we were allowed in on Zoom for one hour on um, Wednesday, I think it was, to watch Bishop Dan be inaugurated to become the bishop. Yes. And then that was all that we could do. And then the next day, the service started that was open to us at 6 o'clock in the morning. Patty, <laughs> that's faithfulness. It is. It is. So it is. The thing about it is, Marilyn must have been unbelievable in her time with Synod in the Synod office because yet again this year, they thank you for your help and all the work that you did for them. Um, and what the other thing that they said was that Anna needs to be a part of church planting because it's part of the D of the DNA of the churches. Um, Bishop Trevor will be on call for this next year, and uh, Bishop Dan moves to Ottawa in the summer. And then that was it. So, in a nutshell, that's it. Thank you, Patty, for that report from Synod. Excellent. <laughs> yes? I was, I was supposed to do the second reading today. Uh, we live in Lower Blue Ridge. Mount Seymour Parkway westbound was closed at Riverside. It took me an hour and a half to get there. Oh, yeah. That was supposed to be because, <laughs> 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 was to be because it's our son's girlfriend's birthday tomorrow. Deb had ordered the corsage and the floor so no. we opened the floor, so I brought the girl off to keep racing up here. Wow, Bill. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, you. Thanks for being here. Yes, yeah. Actually, uh, good to see you, Bill. Uh, Bill has graciously offered to take some of the. Oh, and one more, Bill. Was later in the email bulletin this week. Yep. Uh, Bill and I will be collecting refundable beverage containers. If you want to take two, three, four of them back to uh, return it, give them to us. We'll have to bunch them all together, and it all goes into the uh, St. Timothy Church account. Awesome. Bill, thanks. Okay, now only three more things. <laughs> Almost as long as the service. Oh! <laughs> uh, first of all, please make sure. Sorry. That's cold. That's cold. Uh, make sure you're returning these uh, Eucharist booklets. Uh, at the end, I think maybe a few of them have uh, been taken home, but we've got a few more coming. Uh, second, if you are in need of prayer at the end of the service, please join me in the in the back corner. And the final thing is save the date on December. 17th is a Saturday. 
Uh, Linda, thanks very much, is going to be organizing a dinner for us. Uh, more details to follow. Great. And that will be kind of our Advent Christmas supper celebration, is that right, Linda? Excellent. Any other announcements? Let's stand for the blessing. <laughs> And now the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our sending him is him 362. No, 632. 632. <laughs> <laughs>
Hallelujah. Let us go.